It's 5 p.m. I think that we can start. So welcome to this webinar, this add and not webinar named Teaching Online Competences, Debate in a Post-Confinement Scenario. I am Francesca Menduni, a newly elected member of the Eden NAP Steering Committee. Uh, before we start uh, with the topic, uh, with uh, uh, the two speakers, I would like uh, to introduce you the, the NAP, the activities of the NAP briefly. Then I will tell you something more about the speakers and then we will leave the floor to the speakers. In the between, um, between the first presentation and the second presentation, in order to uh, engage you, we will start to answer questions that we will receive. And at the end, we will try to answer to all your questions. Of course, speakers, we will involve in answering your question by using the, the chat. So I'm asking if we can start presenting the um, Eden and NAP uh, PowerPoint. I will ask to the technical if they can show the presentation. Perfect. Okay, so um, I am Francesca Menduni and I am a, a member of the Eden NAP Steering uh, uh, Committee. Uh, if you don't know what is the Eden NAP, the uh, NAP is the network of uh, academics and uh, professionals. The aim of the NAP are supporting networking of individual members of the association, providing a highly effective meeting and communication forum and is coordinating by its own steering committee elected by a ballot of NAP members. Uh, the NAP provides information for members and opportunity for professional actions, help members to build up a personal portfolio, including documents, resources, blogs, and so on, promote communication, networking, and increase the coherence of Eden as learning community, and help in finding partners, uh, partners within membership. Uh, this is the newly elected uh, NAP Steering uh, uh, Committee uh, with uh, Orna uh, Farrell, Francesca Menduni, Igor Balaban, Ines Gil Gaurena, Mohamed Samir, and uh, Vlad Mieshu. And um, if you want uh, to uh, be involved in the Eden NAP, this is the link where you can uh, create uh, your profile, your uh, uh, e-portfolio online, and uh, um, create a network with uh, your peers and professionals. Uh, there are many different benefits to be involved, uh, such as belonging to the largest community, an open distance and e-learning uh, uh, in Europe, access to the EDENS uh, database. Uh, you can delegate uh, up to 30 individuals in the NAP from your institutions. You can attend conference at reduced fees. You can establish establishing partnership and exploring projects. And you have free access to electronic versions of EDEN conferences proceedings and many other uh, advantages. And uh, um, I wish to uh, invite you to the EDEN 2020 annual conference that this year will be uh, virtual and uh, will be organized by uh, University of Timisoara. And uh, um, I wanted to tell you that the call for paper is open throughout May, so you have time to uh, present uh, your paper, your abstract or poster or workshop or so on. And uh, uh, thank you. And uh, now I want to leave the floor to the first presenter. And uh, Alfredo Soero is an Eden Executive Committee member and Eden Senior Fellow. He's also Academic Director and Vice President of Civil Engineer at University of Porto. He's also Prorector of University of Porto. 
is founder of different European association and network in the field of educa education, such as uh, the European University Continuing, Continuing Education Network, Network of Continuing Education in Latin America and in Europe, and uh, Association of the Portuguese University for Continuing Education. Is president of different associations, including the International Association of Continuing Engineer Education, AUPEC, and CEFI. So uh, we have a big, uh, important speaker today. So I will want to leave the floor to him. And uh, let's start. Um, thank you, Francesca. Grazie. Um, I, I don't have any responsibility now in terms of the administration, thank God. So, no, I'm just a teacher and researcher. But I, I, it's true that I occupy those. Uh, thank you, but thank you for the CV. Very, uh, very good. Um, uh, the, the, I welcome everyone. I, I want to, to talk a little bit about. Um, I only have 10 slides, so I hope I can meet the, the, the time allotted. And um, um, the, the reason why I propose this topic is that uh, uh, there is this uh, big change in the life of everyone, as you know, and um, uh, the reason uh, uh, to discuss this teaching online competences is not new. It existed before because, for instance, I'm not a, a teacher online. I do, uh, do courses and attend courses and... Uh, uh, have uh, participated in a lot of research on this topic, but I see that everyone now. Let's uh, let me advance the the, the, the slide. Um, people are now performing online without proper training. That's that's one one issue. Uh, the other issue is that uh, uh, to be a teacher online, it's not enough to place materials on the web or use Zoom and uh, use the digital tools of uh, communication that are available. Um, and um, like I said, this question existed before the pandemic. Uh, who can teach online? What, what is the, the terms of reference for the competences necessary to teach online? Um, we will have uh, Professor Wu Fellers talking about that uh, after me. But uh, this topic that I'm presenting is a proposal that has been placed to the executive committee um, already. We are discussing that in the exec executive committee of Eden, what are the uh, necessary competences to teach online. And this is based on a study from Calovi, uh, the guidelines and reference points for the design and delivery of degree programs in teacher education. What competences should teachers have? And it was adapted from this publication to the, uh, to the, to the context of teaching online. So it's just a proposal, and it's based on another proposal that you can consult for teachers in general. Uh, we're going to discuss this. There is a proposal, uh, this uh, slide, uh, misses there that the proposal, the workshop in the next Eden conference that was mentioned to you is just a proposal, and we will discuss this topic uh, also in the conference. So that's a reason to attend the conference. Um, so what is this uh, reference framework uh, with the descriptors for uh, the competences necessary to teach online? This is connected with the European Qualification Framework, Level 6, the first cycle, and the descriptors are grouped in, uh, in three uh, perspectives. Uh, the knowledge necessary, and uh, it's generally what uh, we talk about uh, competences, mostly people discuss knowledge, but it's also necessary to have certain skills to apply the knowledge, and also you have to have the right attitude. People can have knowledge and skills, but do not have the autonomy and responsibility to fulfill the necessary competence. So those are the three uh, dimensions or perspectives of the of, uh, European Qualification Framework. And these terms of reference or framework 
is precisely grouped into these three uh, perspectives. So let's talk about dimension one. Um, teachers online probably need to have um, competences in terms of knowledge, skills, and autonomy, uh, or attitudes, I prefer to call it attitudes, um, in terms of knowledge management creation. Of course, um, this is, um, this is uh, what I think you should um, uh, take a look. And uh, if you don't have these competences, probably you should take some courses, some training, to be able to uh, fulfill these uh, required terms of reference. Uh, I, I'm not going to uh, take a look. This is a proposal. Take a look at each one. Uh, we are here to present the proposal and have um, opinions from you and from anybody that wants to discuss this. But it, it's, it's important that we have terms of reference, a framework. Uh, another dimension is the question of um, uh, the competences necessary for learning, teaching, and assessment, which are the main components of a teacher. And these have to be adapted to the online context. Uh, how do you manage uh, the digital content uh, to enhance uh, your learning in terms of uh, uh, teaching? And how do you, how much do you know about the assessment process online? You you have to acquire these uh, these competences. You have to have the skills to apply it, and you have to have the um, attitudes, correct attitudes, uh, the capacity and com commitment to transmit that to to your uh, courses and to your actions. Now, the third dimension, it's um, how do you uh, concentrate on the learners, on the, on the students, let's say, or on the trainees? Um, you, you have to, to, to foster their development. This is uh, when we talk about student-centered uh, activities, teaching, learning, and assessment. These are the competences that uh, probably are necessary to have this uh, student uh, and learner environment. How do you uh, work with your uh, students and your learners so you can give them uh, potential and creativity? How do, how do you have these competences you don't have? You may have in part. I don't think that anyone cannot have all these competences 100%, but at least you, you need a certain uh, comfortable amount of competences within these, uh, these uh, competences to be able to teach online. Now, the fourth dimension is the, the, the role of uh, the teacher in terms of society, in terms of values, of ethical ethics, and um, and social engagement, you have to be able to uh, participate in your courses and in your teaching with the right competences. For instance, the commitment to build a, a sense of social responsibility for, for the learners in terms of personal, professional, and contextual levels. Uh, these are competences in this dimension that teachers should have. And I, I would say that this framework or terms of reference is not exhaustive, but I think it has the, the six main dimensions that I think uh, we think that when we propose this uh, and we are discussing it are necessary. The, the one of the most, um, out of the six, I would say this uh, for the success of teaching online, I think I would say that this one is probably the most relevant one. It's very difficult to communicate with learners. And uh, you have to have competences. Uh, what are the, the critical elements for communicating at online level? How do you do it? How do you um, manage a community? How do you get involvement from a community of learners? How do you get them to participate uh, in, the, in, the, in the learning activities? Um, so you, you have to be able to have these online interactions to work in teams and groups. Uh, to use the correct social media to have this uh, communication. Let me tell you that during these two months, uh, I became an um, uh, online teacher for, for my students. And uh, 
it was really a learning experience for me to to communicate with them. I have had some successes, but um, in, in fact, um, uh, there are other aspects that we cannot solve with online teaching, and but there are others that they work much better. Um, but uh, we can talk about that later. But anyway, these are the competencies that uh, are proposed in terms of communication. And lastly, um, the, 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 the characteristic of um, the people that are in education, I, I've been involved in continuing education for 30 years now, about 30 years, I, I, can, I can call uh, that period uh, the start of my involvement in, in uh, lifelong learning. And um, this is a characteristic of people that are involved in education and teaching and learning. You have to be a lifelong learner. And, and the professionals uh, that are involved in online are, have even more responsibility to develop these, uh, these competencies. You, you have to know the new sources, the tools, the, 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 the effectiveness of these tools. You have to be critic about uh, the technology. A lot of people are fascinated with technology, but uh, if they are not effective in terms of learning, they are useless. They are just uh, circuits. And uh, you, you have to, to be critical about all these uh, developments and um, uh, you have to keep developing your own competences in terms of lifelong learning. And that's about it. Um, I have this final message. Uh, this is not uh, definitive uh, reference, so your contribution is welcome. And uh, I would like to thank you in the name of future learners that could benefit from a proper uh, reference to capacitate and to accredit those that are currently working online. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alfredo. And uh, so we will wait uh, for some questions before to go to Ulf. I have a question for you. Uh, since uh, now teachers cannot go out to have professional training, do you have any online courses to suggest to develop teaching skills, uh, especially uh, oh. online yeah. teaching skills? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, there are plenty of courses online. For instance, there are several MOOCs in the Open Ed Up platform, for instance, that you can consult. But there are many. Uh, and if anyone asks Eden, I think Eden has a lot of um, resources to, to help uh, those that want to, teach, to, to learn more about teaching online. I mean, that, that won't be a problem. But let me tell you something. There was a course uh, from a colleague of mine from Georgia Tech about teaching online. And it was, uh, I don't know, two years ago or three years ago. And it was a free course about the pedagogy of teaching online. And there were more than 300,000 registered people. <laughs> they had to cancel the course because it was impossible to handle 300,000 people in the course of, there is a lot of interest. Um, there is a lot of um, opportunities. Um, and um, it's just a question of uh, trying to find reliable courses uh, about it. So. Thank you. And we have another question. So uh, do digital tools really contribute in improving single subjects and in particular the linguistic ones? Um, I think um, any, any subject can be handled uh, online. It just needs the proper contest, the proper uh, pedagogy or andragogy, but it, it, it just needs to be prepared quickly. I, I personally am, uh, I can say that because it's a free uh, tool, so I'm not making publicity, but I, I use Duolingo a lot. I, I want to learn German. I wanted to learn German, and uh, Wolf is probably smiling, I guess, but it's not an easy, I tried it when I was young, and it's not an easy language, uh, all these uh, declinations and everything. So uh, I use Duolingo, and I can say that I I progressed. So personally, I, I learned a little bit of German uh, online, 
I, when I was doing it face to face when I was young, I, I, I didn't do as well. So that took my, that is, there are uh, programs and, and tools and platforms that are very effective for teaching online uh, specific subjects. Yes. Yes, I agree with Duolingo. I had experience, good experiences as well. So uh, I think that we can go on with the second speaker. And I want to um, uh, give a short presentation about him as well. Uh, it's Ulf Daniel Hellers. He's full professor for educational management and lifelong learning at baden württemberg State University in Germany. Uh, he has been vice president for quality and academic affairs at the same university for the past six years. Ulf is an educational scientist and holds degree in English language, social sciences and educational sciences. He took his PhD in the field of technology and enhanced learning in 2003. Ulf is an internationally recognized researcher and innovator in the area of educational technology. He has developed the learner's quality model for e learning, which is a basis for learner-centered quality development in e learning. Is working as advisor to governments and non-governmental non organizations in the field of e-learning and development cooperation, and is member of several advisory boards and editorial committees. So I give the floor to Wolf. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Francesca. I hope that uh, everybody can hear me. Um, I was very happy, actually, when um, I had uh, the chance to present uh, in this particular situation. And um, I was thinking that it is a good, is a, is a very, very good situation to um, stop for a while and to think about what has happened in the past 10 weeks. In my university, um, I am uh, having the role of being the advisor for digital transformation. And um, we are a presence university, a presential university, a normal university. And for the past years, also, when I uh, still had been a, a vice president of the university, uh, I have always tried to um, convince people of uh, going online and of the benefits of flexibilization of uh, higher education uh, studies through online teaching. And uh, it was always hard to convince not only teachers, but also students. And uh, now, since 10 weeks, we are doing nothing else than going online, teaching online, and from one day to the other, we had to switch our 35,000 students uh, to become online students. And not only our 35,000 students, but also our 780 professors, uh, which are working on the nine campus of the university um, and more than 6,000 part-time lecturers, which we are having. Um, and this is a major experiment, actually. It is a real, real major experiment. And uh, I'm sure that you all have the same situation uh, in your own institutions, in your own countries. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the experience which we are having. Uh, and it's just a snapshot, actually, a snapshot reflection of where we are today. Uh, and it is really about the experiment of shifting uh, higher education in its entirety, entirety entirely uh, uh, online. I think that what we can see is that technology is not unimportant and it never has been unimportant, but it's becoming clear that for the success of online learning, technology is still what I like to call a hygienic factor. 
That means that if we improve the infrastructure, if we have the capability to switch on more technology, more Zoom platforms, more Adobe Connect platforms, um, still we will have more technology, but it will not automatically lead to a greater satisfaction. So it is important, and we are talking about in a, a little bit of reflex discussion, we have been talking about in the first one, two, three weeks, a lot about technology. Everybody said, where is the technology which we can use uh, to teach online? Uh, and that was the biggest problem, really. But today we notice that we have um, other challenges to solve, that technology is not solving the problem, that it is necessary, but not solving the problem. We are rather seeing that we have to overcome the, what I call the synchronous reflex. So everybody wants to teach live. Everybody wants to teach live classes like we do now, actually. And uh, I think that it is important uh, in our discussions, in our own institutions back home, to start thinking how we can overcome this situation. Of course, it's true. We can teach live. We can teach in a synchronous way, in a virtual classroom, our students. One hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, one course after the other. But we will quickly realize that the real power of online learning is not in the synchronous mode of teaching and that the live moments which we can create probably are not ideally suited to transfer knowledge, but rather to see our students, to view them, to share moments together, to create a, um, a reference frame of a presential atmosphere with them, to um, induce um, um, a feeling of we care for each other and we are expressing this. We are asking um, mutually, where are you right now, actually, in your learning journey? We are not using these live sessions any longer, uh, and we maybe should not use so many live moments, live virtual classroom teaching moments to lecture the students, but rather to engage them into a dialogue about their current learning journey. And then create online learning experiences in which they are engaging with resources, with other students in group interaction, and where then they come back and share and feed back other students which are presenting their learning outcomes. So, and this is the moment, in my view, where real, real online teaching competencies are needed. Because from my experience, for my colleagues who are professors in a normal presential university, this is a real challenge to create this artistic network of activities online, which are not synchronous, but which are asynchronous moments. And speaking about that, I think it is important to more and more notice now where we know that um, Corona situation probably will stay for some more weeks, months, maybe one more year. I don't know how it will turn out in the end. But now is the moment to notice that um, for online learning this is not a deficit. Online learning is not proposing a deficit model. We are often hearing the words, the terminology, and our colleague Don Olcott has written about that just recently, last week, in a, in a LinkedIn blog post, uh, that this term remote is often carrying um, a deficitary mindset. We are talking about remote social distance teaching, 
and we think about uh, about it in a way that we are asking ourselves, when can we stop this? When can we overcome it? But more and more of my colleagues in my own university notice that there is also a value proposition behind online learning, that online learning has a power, that online learning has an opportunity to um, create more individualized learning pathways, to create flexible learning in a, a much better way than we sometimes can do that in presential situations. And that this value proposition is something where people are now in week 10 start to talk about how can we maybe carry over some of these values, value proposition of, of these opportunities also into the past corona uh, time. So the proposal is to go beyond the deficit mindset here. We are starting now to experiment with something which is this, you know, this holy grail um, factor of higher education, which is assessment. Assessment is what our institutions are actually um, making uh, unique institutions. We are the only ones who can assess. Teaching can be found everywhere, in MOOCs, uh, open online courses, in the internet. You can find materials, you can, can find courses. But if you want to have a certification, um, there's only one way, and that is to go to a university and to be assessed for a certain field, a certain area of knowledge. And in European higher education, we use a lot of what Mark Brown in a recent uh, article uh, called the um, pump, pump, dump model. So our students are in a way taking in the knowledge in lectures and then dumping it back on the assessment sheet, on the test sheet, on the final exam sheet. And the, the situation we are having now is that we cannot perform tests and assessments in the same way um, like we uh, did before. And so we can think about to start changing our pedagogy. And um, the pedagogy is the real professional part. And when we enter a virtual classroom, when we enter an online learning scenario, we immediately notice that it takes a real professional online pedagogy and experience to create um, moments of interaction between the students. And more so, it takes professionalism in online pedagogy and experience to create moments in which, um, in which we are assessing our students in a continuous way, for example. Portfolio assessments in my university are now everywhere allowed, where before we were allowing only written tests in many, many situations. So this is challenging for online lecturers, for my colleagues, for professors, and again, we need teaching competencies here. And I hope that we take the chance and spill over some of this innovative teaching which comes over, uh, comes from this new ways of thinking about assessment uh, also after uh, Corona times. Collaboration is key and we know that, of course, and I think what we know today and what I can really from my heart share with you is we have never been such a solid, such experienced such moments of solidarity in our, excuse me, my phone is ringing, we have such, never experienced uh, such moments of solidarity between our colleagues. We have never moved so closely together. Sometimes we are meeting with colleagues, with groups of colleagues, two times a week in stand-up meetings, where we just talk about our experiences sometimes. And that's such a beautiful um, experience right now, which uh, I think we should really try to keep. And uh, 
One of the real great uh, uh, ideas of one of my colleagues was this, what I called here, the Espresso Bar online meeting on Tuesdays at four o'clock, which we are doing now every three weeks, actually. We are having a virtual Espresso Bar uh, meeting and everybody is bringing uh, their espresso and a piece of uh, chocolate cake or whatever they like. And we are meeting, we are just exchanging without agenda. And that's really, really beautiful. So let's try to keep this kind of um, practices. Uh, so to 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 carry over the solidarity uh, solid, so solidarity moments, uh, which you know as professors we don't have so often. I think we can uh, admit that actually. Um, we need um, OER currently more than ever, and OER. I, I, I entitled the slide OER Works Now. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a more reflective mood, I would probably say um, OER is in demand now. Maybe it doesn't work now, but it's in demand more and more. Um, and we are having here just as a side note, I'm not going to spend time on, on that. We have, just start, we have just started three months ago a European project called Open Game. And this is a project in which we are developing um, an online game for teachers to learn uh, which competencies they need to use OER in a classroom. And it's not just about uh, the competencies to search for OER or to create OER, it's also competencies about um, engaging students in meaningful OER um, interactions, teaching with OER, and we are also using this knowledge, skills, and uh, attitudes uh, model, uh, of course, for, com for the competencies which we are creating. Yeah, I'm coming to my last point. Um, listen to the student's voice. Um, students are now at home, studying from their own, uh, often, the place where they grew up uh, in, 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 in their um, parents' house. Um, and we are talking a, a lot about that. And we have now started a podcast, actually. It's, it's in German, uh, but we will next week start to internationalize it, in which we are interviewing students in five minutes to ten minutes a radio show-like uh, podcast about their situation and what they feel are good strategies of universities to engage them into learning and what doesn't work really. And this has turned out to be so valuable to listen to students, to understand what um, their situation is when they sit in front of their computer and are um, trying to make sense of uh, their studies now at home and uh, online. So these are just eight points of reflection of where we are today, uh, and uh, I hope that some of the points which I, I made are points which you can connect to, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about it. And I'm also using the final welcomes, um, farewell slide of Alfredo, and say to you, thank you in the name of the learners. <laughs> Thank you so much for the nice presentation. We had a lot of interesting questions. I think the first one is for Ulf, because someone says that love the idea of living behind the deficit mindset. However, someone asks, what do you mean by the term deficit mindset? So maybe you can explain better this concept. Yeah, it's actually quite uh, simple. Um, when we started uh, in corona confinement uh, asking ourselves what on earth can we now do to continue our universities uh, we were finding us in a first moment um, of awkwardness because we were thinking oh i think we think we can only go online and that's going to become really really difficult and it's going to be a real nightmare for students. And now, that's the deficit mindset. And now we more and more see, and more and more of my colleagues understand, that actually 
online learning has a real value proposition to bring to the table of higher education, we can engage students in a beautiful way. And it's not a deficit model, it's really a valuable model of teaching. And I hope that we can carry over this, um, this digital transformation wave where it makes sense also to the time after Corona. That's what I mean with that. Thank you for the explanation. Um, I read another question uh, for both, I think. Don't we think that we all should establish an integrated distance education system and an OER network, nation-specific, based on OER architecture for future integration so that the relevant course can be fought by all online? I can read again the question. The, don't we think that we all should establish an integrated distance education system, nation-specific, and an OER network nation-specific based on OER architecture for future, inter for future integration? Uh, just if I might make a first. Um, I, I think that is a valuable proposition. I think yes. Um, I have been spending like 10, 12, 15 years on this idea of integrating OER better into higher education in different uh, ways. Uh, and I think we need both. We need uh, more um, uh, efforts on a national, maybe also a European level, to create networks of OER and the Scandinavian countries are really an example there. They have um, a PAM Scandinavian infrastructure for learning materials, open learning materials, and we can learn from that. But also on an institutional level, we need more efforts to create cultures of sharing. If we cannot um, convince our colleagues, professors, uh, to use lecture materials of other colleagues, uh, we will never uh, succeed, even if we have the most beautiful um, national infrastructure. And this is actually what we do. We, we, we work on both levels. We work on the national and the European level, and also we work on uh, with Eden also, and with the NEP also, on the institutional level. I think both is, both is needed there. Thank you. I have a question that I think that it's for both of you. Uh, what is the best way to gain these competencies uh, from webinars, online courses, badges, certificates, or is uh, experience really the only way to gain these competencies? So I think that I it refers to teacher competencies. Yeah. Yeah, I can go first and, and then Ruth can. Uh... Uh, complete, uh, but uh, I think that all of them, uh, all of them are learning experiences. Uh, uh, I think that, for instance, if you look at the proposal for the competence framework, if you see that you have a deficit uh, or you want to learn more about one of the competences, you may look for courses that uh, are providing those learning outcomes, those competences. Uh, you can also look for projects. Uh, that are available on the web. Uh, the European Commission has made a tremendous effort of providing projects with, with uh, lots of uh, uh, outcomes in terms of competencies for teaching online and online learning. Uh, one that I remember about the teaching, uh, it's uh, one that I participated where there was an evaluation of all the most significant tools for uh, communication, for teaching, for video producing, there was a rating, and uh, and there was um, also uh, instructions on how to use each one of those tools. And, and that is available. That is for free. It's Project Modern. You can Google it, and uh, and it, it, it's, it's it, but like that one are uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, course uh, projects from the Commission with that um, with that uh, objective. But I, I guess. 
basically to answer Lisa's question is that uh, if you want to learn a, a certain type of um, competence of teaching online, you can search uh, whatever exists and uh, uh, you'll find it, I'm sure. Thank you. I can also uh, add to that um, that, uh, of course, um, if there is a possibility, um, ask somebody who is having experience with this. And um, in your own institution, most of us who are in this in this uh, webinar today are in in some kind of institutional setting, and you are working with colleagues. You you have colleagues, and some of them are more advanced, some of them are less advanced. Um, and I can really really recommend the most successful thing we did in week two and week three was just to open um, an Adobe Connect uh, room every day from one to two uh, and make a schedule uh, and ask colleagues who have experience just to talk about their experience from one, for one hour over lunch. That's it. And we did that for two weeks and it was incredible. We every Every day we had more than 60 participants coming to this kind of uh, sharing uh, moments, so to speak. Uh, and I think this is really the, the, the fastest track to, to, to get inspiration of, of, of what we can do. And then, of course, there are all kinds of, of, of other support services and all that what Alfredo said also. I just want to remind that Francesca presented uh, an app in Eden, which is has more than thousand, I don't know the numbers, but has a lot of professionals. So join the app and exchange with the, with the others. Like Ulf was saying, we, we have to talk, we have to know from each other. It's a time of uh, change, big changes. And the way to handle it is to talk to others and with your peers and uh, cooperate. Yeah, and, and one of the central figures of our community, Steve Wheeler, for example, he was just sitting down and recording five sessions, um, which you can freely uh, download and, and view uh, on how to improve as an online educator. Uh, or uh, Mark Brown from the Dublin City University, they were doing a MOOC on how to um, become an online educator, or the ICDE, the International Council of Distance Education. They were doing um, uh, um, sessions on how to become a better online educator. Or the Eden community is doing the COVID-19 uh, webinar series uh, every, I don't know, three weeks, uh, in which the next one is taking place, I don't know, just next week. Every Monday, every Monday. Every Monday. Uh, yeah. Every Monday, even <laughs> sorry, every Monday um, evening at five, in in which we are talking about uh, these issues. So there are in, in lots, lots, lots of um, possibilities to inform yourself uh, and get inspiration. Yes, exactly. There are many opportunities and we need to have also self-regulating skills and autonomy-driven learning skills to decide which learning paths are better for, uh, for us. So transversal skills for teachers. We are receiving a lot of interesting questions also from um, uh, other uh, non-European countries and I want to read the one from US. Uh, in uh, the U.S., there are several states that have established an online teacher training certification that is mandatory for pre-service te uh, teachers uh, to take in order to receive their teaching license. Do you know whether there is a similar certification in Europe? Um, I, can, I don't know that. Uh, in Germany, we do not have that. Um, but uh, what we have is on a national level um, the attempt to 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 establish a network. It is already established, but it's not mandatory. It is um, voluntary, 
in which you can register and you can um, display your um, digital teaching competencies there. You can you can uh, display them, you can talk about it, you can assess them there. Um, uh, and you can, so to speak, join a network of yeah, expert colleagues um, uh, to, 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 to join the group to share the experience. I know also that this is existing in, in Ireland, um, um, but I don't know how it is in, in, in other countries. Um, but for sure, these kind, even, even if not mandatory, for sure, I'm, I'm a firm believer that this kind of resources um, should be uh, available to every, every teacher um, so that at least on a voluntary basis they can qualify themselves. Yeah, I can. Thank you. Yes, please. I can add that I'm supervising a PhD student on the regulation of uh, distance learning. Uh, and in Europe, there is no regulation at all. Uh, so the answer to that American colleague is that, um, up to my learners, that there is no country that uh, requires a specific certificate for online teaching. I mean, the teachers are um, in many countries because teaching online is considered uh, like teaching. So if you want to be a teacher online, you just have to be a teacher. So that's what it, as far as I know, that's what happens in Europe. Thank you. And I want to read also a question from YouTube because people are watching us also from YouTube. Uh, what about teaching technical laboratories that need experiments to be run? This is a very interesting question, I think, for, especially for teachers that come from STEM topics. I'm an engineer, so I'm, I'm aware of several initiatives and associations and conferences on virtual laboratories. So that exists for some years already. They do amazing things with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Wolf, but they are remote. They are <laughs> remote laboratories. They are called remote laboratories, but they do experiences like in a physical laboratory and that exists. Uh, I, I can give the, so there, is, there are conferences, world conferences about it. There are, there are several associations dedicated just to virtual uh, laboratory, laboratory and experiments. So that, 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 is, that exists. It's just a question of sharing the information about it. Thank you. And uh, I want to read another question. One second, add this one. Uh, could we catch this corona situation to assess digital competences with the disciplines using the DigiComp model? I don't know if Wolf wants yes. to talk about, talk about. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the DigiComp model is the uh, model on the European level for digital competencies. Um, uh, I'm not sure now if um, an operationalized version of, um, of a reference framework exists which can be used to assess teaching competencies. Um, when we started our open game project, which I talked about, the open game project, uh, for OER teaching competencies, um, we were researching um, the open the the DigiComp model, and um, we were finding that it is um, containing all the dimensions, but that it is not so easy operationalizable to assess somebody. Um, so um, I think that that 
we still need to make some efforts to become better in um, presenting models like uh, the one Alfredo was actually um, presenting today, uh, in which teaching competencies are really uh, operationalized, spelled out uh, in a clear way, and also show a pathway, you know, not just to, to tell you um, you are an expert or you are a novice, but also to show a pathway. What do you need to do now uh, in the next step? Yeah. Um, in our European project Open Game, what we do is we define competencies which teachers need, and then we have um, gathered, collected 48 uh, cases in which these competencies uh, can be. Um, are becoming visible and we are presenting that to teachers so they have a reference case for each of these competencies, several reference cases and uh, we are convinced that this helps really. So the answer is I think there is no one-to-one -one assessment framework or based on digital competency uh, framework but that um, we have other frameworks which are either developing now or, like the one Alfredo presented, are already developed. Thank you. I think that we have time for at least two other questions. So I want to read this one. Uh, how can one catch up without messing up and without giving students an unpleasant experience? experience from which they might not recover? Yeah, I, I, my suggestion is uh, try to learn from the others, from the mistakes of the others. And, uh, and um, let's say one of the things that I, I think it's very important is to communicate with students. The, the, what uh, Wolf mentioned about the portfolio is very interesting. Uh, because uh, with a portfolio, you can have an indirect way of communicating with students and verify if they are comfortable with what you are proposing in terms of uh, your course online and what happens. But um, the, the, the point is that with the new uh, digital tools, you can communicate with uh, each one of them very effectively if you want. If you don't want, uh, you, you don't, but you can communicate and uh, you have ways of, uh, of uh, verifying if the experience is unpleasant, unpleasant or not. But first, start by learning with the others. What are good practices, what works, what doesn't work, and uh, then keep on communicating with your own students. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, and um, also I think um, the one really important, very simple and first thing we should all do is we should use technology to connect to our students. To connect to our students. This morning I was talking uh, to uh, a colleague here in my university, a professor, and we were talking about online um, uh, social presence. So how to create a, the feeling of a social presence online, although we are not together, uh, still having the feeling we are together, like we now actually are, you know. <laughs> and. And he was saying a very simple thing, which I really like. He said, I am asking my students how they are, how they feel, what they need. I'm asking them, you know, I'm starting my session by asking them, how are you? What do you need? How do you feel? It progresses now, you know. So, and um, uh, he says, there, it's not that, that everybody is then starting to talk. But some are starting to talk and immediately you have the feeling of not sh shouting into a dark room, <laughs> but of entering into a situation of a dialogue, actually. 
that's benefiting everybody. Let, let me tell you also one advice, very simple. You, you, to avoid unpleasant experiences, try to show each student they are not a number, but they are a person. And if you do that, I'm sure that you will not have unpleasant experiences. Thank you. And uh, I, I hope that we have time for a very last question. And uh, I want to tell, tell all the participants that we will try to answer all the questions online uh, by putting your question on the Eden web website. So uh, the last question is this. Uh, um, um, sorry, I lost it. Do you think that uh, uh, a deficit mindset uh, could affect the quality and the productivity of the virtual education? Well, um, yes, um, I, I think that if we are firmly convinced that online learning is just a second-rate learning, uh, it will stay or will become a second-rate learning, actually. So, yes, I challenge you all, be convinced that online learning has a clear, beautiful value proposition of flexibilizing learning, of being a form of learning with high interaction, high individualization of learning, which makes it very valuable, very, very impressive to people sometimes, uh, and very effective. If you think about online learning in such a positive way, uh, I think uh, we can take many, many valuable experiences out of these times of Corona crisis, into a better moment for higher education after the corona crisis. And if I can add something, um, you, you cannot just replicate what happens face to face to online. It, it's not possible. So you have to deconstruct your approach to face to face and build a new one to online teaching. And you probably have better uh, results than face-to-face. -face. That's my conviction for some years now. And uh, with the new technologies, it's even more uh, possible than before. But you have to forget Thanks. the face-to-face -face model uh, because that, that's a big mistake you, uh, to try to replicate. You cannot do it online. You cannot replicate the face-to-face. -face. You have to find a new one. Yes. I think that online education teach us also something about how to do to do it better uh, offline education. I think this is my idea about it. So thank you so much to the presenters. We received a lot of questions, a lot of interesting uh, uh, reflections in the chat and uh, uh, um, the Eden Secretariat, sorry, uh, told us that we have a, a little bit time more to answer other questions. So maybe we can have 10 minutes more to answer to the questions if the speakers agree. They agree. Okay. Perfect. So I will go on now in, with the questions. Um, Okay, considering that not all the academic communities dominate the digital competences, do you think that the academic level will decrease worldwide? It depends. I mean, it, it depends on the way you teach online. You, personally, I think it can increase. The, the level. It depends on the approach, the pedagogy and the pedagogy you use. But um, first, for instance, one of the examples I have are the virtual meetings. If you 
uh, I don't know what's your experience, but my virtual meetings for all associations, different groups, etc., they run much better online than face-to-face. They take at least one-third of the time or half of the time. And um, uh, this is, of course, is not reflected to what happens uh, to teaching and learning, but it is a tool that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, may be used to 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 improve uh, the, the learning. One of the aspects that you can use with online teaching are the simulation scenarios, the, the virtual realities and uh, augmented realities and immersive realities. You cannot do that face to face, but you can do it online. And learning with simulation, at least in certain areas, it's uh, probably more effective than on a real scenario, on a laboratory or something. So. That is my impression. But of course, if you if you not uh, have the you, if you teaching without the necessary competences or approaches or the institutional uh, strategy that it's uh, appropriate, the the level may decrease in the learning, of course. But uh, it all depends of the leaders. And, uh, for instance, Ulf is one of them. If you have the proper persons in the right positions to decide, for instance, the strategy, it's probably a good a good result. If you don't have, then you you may have bad results. Thank you. And uh, I have a, another question. What do you think about students alienating from interactions in person with professors while using online education? So I think that the problem is about alienation of students during online teaching. What do you think about it? Yeah, um, we are experiencing that a lot, that this, you know, everybody knows this, this feeling of professors who are not used to online teaching. They are logging into their virtual live classroom. And then they are seeing um, there are 50 students or how many ever that may, that may be. And now to start teaching uh, and not have this feeling of connection is a terrible feeling actually and uh, we we are as teachers we are feeling what are they doing you know they haven't switched on their cameras we don't know if they are there they are not talking to us you know how in a, in a normal classroom we are at least seeing them sitting there you know even if we don't know if they are following us but we have this you know, this fiction, this illusion of they are with us in one room and that's why it's good, you know. And in an online setting, we do not have this. And we perceive that as alienation, maybe, I don't know. So the task is that you start to think about how can you engage them. And there are lots of possibilities to engage them. Um, online. Um, my advice for this is actually don't do it in a live session. Start thinking about asynchronous online teaching. Just a very, very simple, a very simple method which I learned um, at the University of uh, Maryland uh, University College. I was there for two years, an online professor. Um, was a very simple method, uh, just use online fora and ask your students to post their answers for the week into this forum and then ask other students to post a feedback on these answers in the forum. And suddenly you have 50 students who are posting their answers and if you assign every student to post two feedbacks, every student is getting receiving two feedbacks from other colleagues, 
other colleague students. And that's an interaction which is enormous because suddenly you have 150 posts there. It's rolling and rolling and rolling and such a dense interaction about the topic you can never replicate in a presential classroom, for example. And suddenly, if you start doing that, you see, and, and there are other, other methods, you see um, that alienation is not a topic anymore because people are starting to share. And still again, I mean, it's not working from day one. You need to socialize your students into this kind of work, into this mode of learning and so on. But there are many, many methods which you really can use to, um, to engage your students. Yeah, I would suggest you. if you have, sorry, just if you have live sessions, what the Wolf is suggesting, I think it's very, very relevant to have these surveys uh, like Slido and others or Monkey Survey or something where you get uh, answers and opinions from students and get on and debate. So, like I said, you have to you you have to deconstruct what is face to face and start uh, other approaches that are more suitable for online teaching. So, if you have alienation, probably because we're just talking. And I always remember a, a photograph of um, a teacher giving a recorded lesson on the auditorium. He couldn't be there. He put a recorded uh, session and. Uh, and the, the picture was, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's humor based, but, uh, the, and the, instead of the students, there were recorders on the, <laughs> on the seats because they were not there either. They were just recording what the professor. So you see, you, you have to find the right approach, uh, to, to avoid these, these kind of problems. Thank you. So much for this uh, last thought, and so we are going to close our webinar. The the video recording will be available for the participants on the hidden website and also slide from uh, presenters. Uh, and please remember about uh, our hidden uh, annual conference, uh, virtual conference, and uh, we hope to see you again in the next. Uh, Eden Nap webinars and also in the uh, webinar pandemic uh, series uh, that we have every Monday at 5 p.m. Thank you so much. Hope to see you. Thank you to the presenters. Bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone.